let me encourage you, if you would, go ahead and grab your Bible and join me in Romans chapter five. If you are new to Shades this morning, we are so grateful that you're here with us. And we are walking through a study right now in Romans chapter five and six, looking at what the word of God says about how we can live a life that has truly been set free. And so each week, we're just walking through a portion of these two chapters of the scripture in Romans. And, and we just pick up right where we left off last week. So today, we're gonna be in Romans chapter five, beginning in verse 12. And I just I want to encourage you to turn there with me. But before I step into the Word of God, I just want to say publicly before all of you what a privilege it is for me to have my in-laws here this morning. They are in town from South Carolina, and I don't ever want to take for granted the gift that it is that we get to worship together when those times come. And I also don't ever want to take for granted what a blessing it is to have in-laws who love the Lord and have been spurring us on from the beginning of, of Megan and my relationship. I'm just so grateful for y'all. Would y'all join me in honoring my in-laws? This is like a great privilege for me. So this gets me brownie points when you help me honor my in-laws, but we do. I am so grateful for the family that Megan comes from. And that's actually something that we're gonna step into here a little bit this morning. We see this lineage that is laid out here in Romans chapter five. There is a, a lineage that we all are a part of, we're gonna see here in the scripture. And there is a lineage that we are invited to be a part of. So with that in mind, we turn to Romans chapter five, verse 12. And I wanna invite you, if you're willing and able, to stand with me as we read from the Word of God, to honor the Word of God, to be reminded that the Word of God is the solid rock foundation underneath our feet. It is what the church is built upon. It's what the people of God stand upon. What God says is right and good and true. This is the Word of the Lord. The Scripture says this, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin and death spread to all men because all sin for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted where there is no law yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. As we begin to step into the word of God this morning, I just wanna tell you up front, we're dealing with the issue of sin. And when we deal with the issue of sin, there's something that we often do kind of as a defense mechanism. We begin to think about others and their sin. We begin to think about those who may have wronged us in sin. And what I wanna ask you to do this morning before we pray as we're standing, I wanna ask you as we step into the word of God to pray with me that the Lord would use this scripture to speak into our lives because there's something we need to see. And yes, we, we can think about and be concerned about the sin of others as well, but what I really wanna ask you to do today is invite the spirit of God to speak to you specifically. What do we need to see as we talk about this very difficult topic of sin? So let's pray to that end. Father God, we stand before you needing to hear a word from the living God whose spirit is with us, promised by Jesus himself. And so I pray, Lord God, that you would speak, that you would have your way among us, that we would see what we need to see and hear what you desire for us to hear on this day. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us collectively as a church gathered in this room and gathered online. And thank you, Lord God, for speaking to us individually. So I pray as we gather that you would have your way among us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing with me. The great pastor, Jonathan Edwards, 
of the 17th century has been called one of America's greatest theologians. He pastored for over 30 years in the New England area before he became the president of Princeton University. And Edwards preached a sermon that has been called the greatest sermon in American history. The title of the sermon was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. A difficult title for a very difficult message. Edwards was at the center of what was called the Great Awakening, where literally thousands of people turned to the Lord. Thousands of people recognized their need for a Savior and cried out to Jesus to save them from their sin. A historic season in the history of our nation, the Great Awakening. Edwards was a man who lived his faith. And in living his faith, in addition to preaching his faith, Jonathan Edwards left behind a tremendous legacy of faith and faithfulness. In fact, his lineage has been studied at great length. And here is what is found among the descendants of Jonathan Edwards. In his lineage, there are over 100 pastors, over 100 lawyers. That could be a good or a bad thing, depending on your perspective. That's a joke. You can laugh. Over 80 public officials are in Edwards' lineage, 75 military officers, 65 college professors, 60 doctors, 30 judges, 13 college presidents, three state governors, three U.S. senators, and one vice president of the United States. A tremendous lineage flowing out of tremendous faithfulness. What will your legacy be? What lineage are you a part of? Maybe you're here today saying, I've been blessed with a tremendous lineage, a tremendous family, a tremendous faith heritage that I've received because of the faithfulness of those who have gone before me. But maybe you're here today saying, you know, that's not something I received at all. You may be a first generation believer or you may be trying to determine what you believe and, and you realize that, that faith is not something that has been a part of your family. There's been a comparison done throughout many years of Jonathan Edwards' legacy and the legacy of another man who lived at the same time as Edwards in the 1700s. This man's name was Max Jukes. Max Jukes was known as a criminal who lived his life in and out of prison and died having contributed nothing beneficial at all to society. How is that for a statement attached to someone's name? The lineage of Max Jukes was studied. And among his descendants were over 400 addicts, many of whom died prematurely because of their addiction. There were over 300 who died in poverty. There were over 150 that spent time in prison. 190 lived a life of prostitution. And seven were convicted murderers. A lineage is a powerful thing. What is the lineage that you come from? What is the legacy that you will leave behind? With this, we step back into Romans chapter five and we see a lineage that every single one of us today listening to these words is connected to. And at the same time, as we see this lineage that we all are connected to, we see the Apostle Paul lay out an invitation to a lineage that we all have been invited to join. Look back at Romans chapter 5, verse 12. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, 
and death through sin, and death spread to all men because all men sinned. Now here in verse 12, the Apostle Paul is connecting the second half of Romans 5 and the remainder of this letter to what has already been laid out in the first five chapters of this letter. The first five chapters of Romans serve to lead us to the beautiful gift of justification by grace through faith in Jesus Christ that invites us to be reconciled to God. And here in verse 12, we see very clearly that the gift of reconciliation is something that every single one of us desperately need. Why do we need this? Well, Paul says it's because every single one of us is connected all the way back to the beginning to the first father, Adam, who sinned. And when Adam sinned, sin entered the equation for all of humanity. When sin entered the equation for all of humanity, you and I and everyone else among us was born into a world of sin. But not only are we born into a world of sin, we are born sinners. And the lineage of Adam is a lineage of sin that leads to death. And I, I know this is not a popular topic in our culture at all. In fact, we would love to just dismiss a conversation of sin altogether or minimize or trivialize sin so that we don't really have to take it seriously. We'd love to just say, hey, everybody's accepted. Everything is acceptable. That's what our culture is crying out today. But the word of God says no sin Sin must be honestly dealt with. If there is any hope of true freedom, sin must be honestly considered. If there's any hope of justification in the sight of a holy God, if there's any hope of being reconciled to God and having peace with God, we must be honest with sin. Please don't miss this. Unless we are willing to come face to face with our sin personally in an individual way, unless we're willing to be honest about the sin in our lives, we will never truly understand the beautiful gift that has been laid before us in Jesus Christ. As long as we ignore sin, as long as we minimize or trivialize sin, it will be easy for us to just ignore Jesus altogether or keep God at a distance. But it's when we come face to face with our sin and when we are honest about our sin that we can clearly see we need an intervention. We need something to be done so that we can truly experience this gift that is laid out in Romans 5 called reconciliation with God. So here, beginning in verse 12, the Apostle Paul is taking us on a journey, and it's a journey that can be very challenging because it's a journey that leads us to get face to face with our sin. And what we see in verse 12 here is that sin really does level the playing field. You see, we're all in this together. Sin came into the world through one man's decision, one man's act of rebellion and defiance, Adam, brought sin into the world. But verse 12 says that then all have sinned. All have sinned. Every single one of us has sinned. Sin has spread through all of creation. It has ravaged mankind ever since the fall of man in the garden. All you have to do is look back at the fall 
and look back at the original sin to see that we all have actually participated with our first parents, with our first father, Adam. We all have been partakers of this same sin. In fact, turn back to the very beginning real quickly. Go to Genesis chapter 3. It's important that we see this. Let's let's unpack what the Apostle Paul is revealing here in Romans 5 in this lineage that we are connected to. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. We see there are two great sins in the garden that we all participate in in some form or fashion. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Now there is so much that can be said about this one verse in the garden and what takes place at the fall of man as sin enters the equation. But what we see here is Adam and Eve rejecting what God has laid before them as what is best. They have partaken of a forbidden fruit. They have gone against what God said. They have decided that they know better than God. What is that sin? That's the sin of pride. The sin of pride says, I know what is best for my life. I know better than you, and I know better than God. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the one in charge of my life. I will decide what I think is right for me. I'm going to do what I want to do. I am in control. Don't tell me what to do. If we have even an inkling of honesty in our lives, we will all say in some form or fashion, we have joined our first parents in the sin of pride. In some form or fashion, every single one of us has said, I know better than. I know better than God how to live my life. I know better than God what's best for me right now. I know better than God. Anytime we sin, we are saying, I know better than God. And anytime we take matters into our own hands, instead of believing what God has said is best, We are joining in this lineage of sin that puts us at the center and pushes God or attempts to push God to the edge. That's the sin of pride. But then look at what happens next, this second great sin of the garden that is revealed, a sin that we all have participated in in some form or fashion. Verse seven says this, in the eyes of both of them, were open and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now you probably have seen a, a picture, an artist's rendering of the garden, Adam and Eve hiding behind a tree or a bush with their loincloths on made out of fig leaves. What, what is that all about? Well, this is in response to their sin. What do they do? They hide. There is a sin of hiding. This is the cover up, a refusal to be honest about what has taken place. Every single one of us has participated in this. You see, sin causes shame. It it causes us to feel exposed and we don't want to be exposed and we don't want to be found out and we don't want that sin to be revealed. So we try to cover up that sin and hide that sin, but hiding only perpetuates the sin. Hiding is like a greenhouse where sin can grow and flourish. And every single one of us 
has participated in this sin in some form or fashion, that sin of pride, that sin of hiding, continuing in the legacy of sin that was received by Adam. This is not easy to hear. We're born into a world tainted by sin and we're all active participants in this sin. But please hear this as we go back to Romans 5. You and I will never truly be set free unless we honestly come face to face with the reality that we are a sinner in need of a savior. This is absolutely essential to experience and embrace the freedom of the gospel and the good news of what Jesus Christ has done. Sin came into the world through one man. Sin led to death by that one man's sin. Sin spread to all men, you and me included as sinners, and we all fall short of the glory of God. And we need a savior. Romans 5 verse 13 says, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. There's biblical history here that the Apostle Paul is talking about, but what is he revealing? Well, Paul is reminding us here of the point of the law, the law of God given to us through Moses. He's reminding us of the point of the law. The law does not create sin, as if God just created some some rules that then made us sinners. No, the law was given to us as sin was running wild and rampant, and the law reveals our sin to us, the sin that is already at work in our lives. We often try to compartmentalize or minimize sin. We may say things like, well, I've told a few lies in my life, but I'm not a liar. I mean, liars are bad people. That's not who I am. I'm a good person. I've just told a few little white lies, and and hey, some of them were necessary, okay? There's just a few little lies. I'm not a liar. But what the law says is the law says, no, if you have lied, you are a liar. It's who you are, and you need some help, and you need a savior, and you need an intervention. Our only hope is if somehow we as a liar or we as a sinner get invited to join a new family tree because the family tree that we are connected to in our lineage to Adam is a family tree that is fractured and broken and dysfunctional and leading to death because of sin. The sin in which we all have participated. And so the only way that we can be set free from the the curse of sin is if we step into a new lineage altogether. And the only way that we can be part of a new family tree or a new lineage is for one who is sinless to give their life on a tree to kill the curse of sin that we all have received as sinners. The Apostle Paul is taking us from one tree to another. The only way to go from one family tree to a new family tree altogether is through the one who hung on a tree. Galatians chapter three, verse 13 says it this way, also written by the Apostle Paul, that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. This is the gospel. 
the only way to understand how beautiful this is is to first understand that we are a sinner born into sin, actively participating in sin, and needing a savior. The word of God says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. What is the curse of the law? The curse of the law is when the law is violated through sin, there must be a penalty paid for the violation of the law. And it says here that Christ did for us what we desperately needed a sinless one to do. For it is written, the scripture says, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. This is what Jesus came to do, to break the curse of sin, to break the back of sin, to take from us what we deserve and give to us that which we don't deserve. He offers us his perfect sinless life as a sacrifice for your sin and for my sin and invites us then to not just be called a sinner cursed by the weight of sin, but invites us to be called, listen to this, a child of God. That's a new lineage. We're no longer is, is the, the sinner Adam our, our, our only father and no longer is the lineage of sin our only lineage. No, we've even been invited to a new lineage, a new family tree all together made possible by what Jesus Christ has done giving his life on a tree to break the curse of sin. Have you joined that new family tree? We go back to Romans 5, verse 15, and we see the apostle Paul say, and please, please stay with me here. This is so beautiful. Paul says the free gift is not like the trespass, For if many died through one man's trespass, much more has the grace of God and the free gift of, by the grace, excuse me, of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Now this is the theme that we've been seeing throughout our time here in Romans 5, this, this invitation to justification. And what is that all about? Well, we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks. Justification is all about standing right before God. This is a legal term, a courtroom term that that one has been brought before a judge, accused of a crime, and then they're found not guilty. They are justified in the sight of that judge. And as a result, they are set free. This is what Jesus Christ has done for us, the free gift of God through Christ, his life at the cross, his death for sin, and his resurrection that defeats sin and the grave is an invitation to be justified in the sight of God. The trespass of sin brings death, but the free gift is not like the trespass. The free gift does not destroy. The free gift has no end. The free gift brings life and reconciliation once and for all and forever to all who trust in what Jesus Christ has done by faith. Yes, you and I, belong to a lineage of sin. But yes, 
you and I have been invited to a new family tree. The free gift is not like the trespass. The free gift sets you free, reconciled to God, at peace with God, in the joy of the Father as a child of God. I want to close here this morning, turning over to 1 Corinthians 15 as we just land this for today. We'll step back into Romans 5 next week. I know this one feels a little heavy. This hits a little heavy, especially in our world today. But this is a message that is of the utmost importance. For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and all need a savior to step onto the tree to pay for the curse of sin on our behalf. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 53, says this. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, please don't miss this. Death is swallowed up in victory. Somebody can get excited here. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, the scripture says. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? But please hear this. The sting of death is sin. The sting of death is sin that we all have, that we all participate in, that we all are connected to. The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law that reveals that we have sin, that we are sinners, that we have violated God's law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. So we close with this question today. What tree are you connected to? What lineage describes your life today? We all are participators in the lineage of sin connected to our first father, Adam, this lineage of death and destruction through sin. We all have that in our story. Have you tasted and received the good news of a lineage of faith? For you see, the lineage of that first family tree through Adam is a lineage that leads to the sting of death. Have you been set free from the sting of death by becoming connected to the tree of life that is the tree of victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ? Two very distinct family trees. And between these two family trees sits a cross. The tree on which the Savior gave his life as a curse to break the curse of sin. Which family tree are you connected to? Have you received what Jesus Christ has done? Have you crossed over from death to life, trusting in the victory that has been offered to you through the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord? 
We're gonna have a time of worship similar to what we did last week where we're just gonna let the, the, the word of God permeate our hearts and our minds and we sing in response to, to what God has said. We, we sing, as Michael said earlier, to remind us of who God is and what he has done, that the, that the praises of our mouth would, would be inhabited by the spirit of God and then we sing to, to lift up one another, to be reminded that while sin has broken all of our lives in some form or fashion, if we are in Christ, there is victory. So sing with all that you have and respond to the good news of the gospel. But if you are here or listening to this message today and you've never experienced the good news of what Christ has done to invite you to a new family tree, a family tree of life, a family tree of victory through the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. It is our prayer, it is our hope that today would be the day that you would cross that line of faith from death to life and trust your life to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. As we stand to sing in just a moment, we just want you to know that our connection room is gonna be open. It's gonna have some of our team members there to pray with you and to talk with you. If the Lord is stirring in your heart, there is nothing more important in this moment for you to respond to what God may be prompting you to do in faith. And if you know you need a relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we invite you to go to the connection room as we sing together. Let me pray for us, and then we will lift our voices in worship. Heavenly Father, I realize when we spend a message talking about sin, there is a heavy weight that is felt around the room. This is not something we we want to talk about. This is not something we want brought into the light. Like our first parents, we'd rather hide. For sin feels so heavy. And for so many, sin leads us to great shame. But Lord, you have promised us this victory this beautiful gift of what the Savior has done, breaking the curse of sin by offering his perfect sinless life. Lord, it is unbelievable the good news of the gospel that intersects with the brokenness of sin. So Lord, I pray, I pray for those who might be here today that their story, their only story to this point has been a story of the lineage of sin. Oh, I pray that today would be the day that they would cross over, cross the line of faith, cross from death to life, cross from cursed to forgiven, cross from defeat to victory. Lord, I pray that they would see and experience the good news of what Jesus Christ has done in a personal way by trusting their life to Jesus as Savior and Lord. And for those among us who have already made that declaration and have already received the victory that has been granted through Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord God, that our hearts would overflow in worship and gratitude at the good news of who you are, Lord God, and what you have done for us through Jesus, our Lord. So we commit this time to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.